Well, welcome everybody and welcome Dr. Wood to our very first, you know, golf ending webinar. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. I was looking forward to this. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, your, um, your resume is just like way too long for me to share. <laughs> it's just, you know, your accolades and it's just way too much. I was just sharing with all the people that were, that are here that how I met you by chance that we were sitting at the same table. And then we're talking about, you know, my personal issues, which is like, you know, I suffer from panic attacks and I went through your program and how that's changed my world. And then finding out that you're a sports psychologist working with PGA tour players, like, and I'm a golfer and you're a golfer. It's like, yep. damn, how good is this to, that we can present this to our audience? So, Perfect lineup. So Dr. Wood, if you don't mind, just, uh, and we have some great questions that have been asked. So basically, so I, Today's, what we're going to go over, everyone, is Dr. Wood's going to share some, just some simple key strategies that we can take away to play better golf instantly. Is that correct, Dr. Wood? Yeah. 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 Um, you know, is a pretty, there's a lot of sort of simple things that you can do, um, you know, to improve your game. And that, that's what we can share today. So Wonderful. like anything, you know, there's, there's work to it, but at the same time, there's some simple things that you can learn and practice that will continue to improve your game. Gotcha. So on the, so go, let's, let's, I mean, if you want to just give a small little intro about who you are and what you do, what, you know, who you work with. And so the audience can hear, you know, who we're, who, who we have the honor of speaking with today. Perfect. Yeah. So the program was really developed because of um, trauma. So my wife and daughter had experienced trauma. My wife, um, lived in a very traumatic household as a child with a very angry father. And um, so she was always living in fear. My daughter, when she was 14, was diagnosed with Crohn's. And um, she disclosed to us after that that she had had some abuse that we were unaware of when she was six. And then she ended up with a second autoimmune disorder called idiopathic pulmonary hemosiderosis which is autoimmune where the lungs start filling up with blood. She started coughing up blood. And on both of those Crohn's and the IPH, they told us there's no cure. Uh, they don't know what causes it. She just needs to learn like with Crohn's, you're gonna have to learn to manage it. She had four resections done where they took out 24 inches of her intestines. And they said, she'll just eventually end up with a colostomy bag. And then with the IPH, with the lung uh, issue, they said she should just live near a hospital because her, her lungs could fill up in 15 minutes. So that's what led me to start researching. My wife says, we need to figure this out or we're going to lose our daughter. So I started researching and sort of came to the conclusion that the autoimmune, a lot of the things that people are experiencing are, is coming from trauma, unresolved trauma that continues to loop. It activates the nervous system, which compromises our immune system and compromises our neurotransmitters. And so when people are, so if your immune system is compromised, you're going to get sick. And if your neurotransmitters are compromised, you're going to feel bad. And so basically what trauma is creating is inflammation. That's the response to trauma. And then the inflammation just stays active as long as the trauma is continuing to loop. You know, and, and as Paul talked about, you know, the, the first thing I say to everybody, there's nothing wrong with anybody, right? Your mind is responding to some old data in real time. That's all it is. We just need to do a reset. And when we do the reset of the memory, then we can improve the way we feel. We can improve a lot of the things, um, panic attacks, anxiety attacks, post-traumatic stress. So, I developed the program really because of my wife and daughter. And then at the same time, what I discovered is that when we resolve this trauma, performance goes up because a lot of times the trauma that continues to loop is draining power and energy. So I started, um, I called the program, the inspired performance program. It's all about performance, inspiring the best performance I work with CEOs, executives. I also work with uh, world-class athletes. So we've had, what I love working about with athletes is that we can see improvement very, very quickly um, because you can measure it very fast. So I worked with, from the golf side, you'll love this, Tim Burke, who uh, in 2019 came to see me 
he had, was going to the first tournament of the year in Phoenix. Uh, I think it was in March of 2019. And he said, you know, he heard about our program and he wanted to go through it and see how it could help him perform in these long drive competitions. And so I saw him, I think on Monday or Tuesday, he flew out to the event in Phoenix. And I saw on the golf channel that he was in the finals on Monday night. And so I texted him and said, how are you feeling? And he said, alpha, baby, alpha. <laughs> and that's going to that's gonna make some sense to you when I explain, we want you when you're playing golf to be playing in an alpha brainwave state. Alpha is very focused and very relaxed. And so when you can perform in that state, you perform at your highest level because your nervous system is staying regulated. Um, I think his final drive in that last day was 470 yards. Wow. And just playing with this guy, I was, I was playing in a charity tournament. So I had him come out and, and play in our foursome. And it's just, it, it's a whole new world when you see these guys hit golf balls. I mean, it's just incredible. Um, there was a par four that was about 340 yards and with water all along the side. And he takes out a four iron and puts it on the back of the green. I mean, just crazy distances that he can hit it. And just a really good guy, really nice guy. He won two of the first three tournaments of the year after going through the program, made the finals of every tournament all year. And, th and then COVID hit, so that really killed the long drive stuff for a little while. But he's you know, still doing very well. Um, I also work with um, people who are performing in terms of, I'll give you an example. I don't know if you know the Spartan races. Spartan are those long distance obstacle course marathons. Um, right. I was speaking at the uh, 2019 World Championship for Spartan. I, I speak at a number of their different events. But they asked me to come out and speak at the World Championship in Lake Tahoe. And there was a gentleman, Rob Killian, who's a Special Forces Green Beret, who was running in the race on Sunday the lady who runs Spartan Japan asked me if I could work with him uh, to help him. And so she says, there's three guys that are winning all the races. She said, you know, I'm not expecting that he has to beat them for this to be successful, but I want to use that as the benchmark to see how much he can improve against those three. So I worked with Rob on Friday and he ran in the world championships on Sunday and beat all of them. Wow. And so he, uh, and next closest guy was about a minute and 20 seconds behind him, which at that level is an, an incredible amount of distance. Now I didn't make Rob a better runner. He was always that good. What happens and this is what I try to explain is that when we're in a constant stress situation, we're pulling a lot of energy, mental energy, physical energy from our system. That's going to affect our performance. So by getting Rob to be able to stay calm and calm his nervous system down, he's going to perform better. He was always that fast. He just didn't have the access to that power. And so the same thing translates into golf. Um, you know, you need to have all that mental focus, but it's also the physical side of it as well that is pulling and draining on the system. Hmm. And so if you start to... to um, get stressed out on a golf course, that's going to then send alerts to your brain, right? That you're under stress and that becomes a lion on the golf course. And if there's a lion out on the golf course, you know, it's a metaphor, but if there's a lion out on the golf course, your mind is going to be looking for lions everywhere because right. it's survival based. So your subconscious mind is always trying to protect you, always keep you safe. And as long as those lions are running around, your mind is not going to be fully attentive to what it's doing now. And that's true for the professionals at the same time. So it's not just amateurs that do that. Even the professionals do it. Right. And, and that's why they're you know, interested in going through our program to, to help them with that side of it. Wonderful. So I find like with, with, with helping us with golf, right. With the mental. So we, you talked about the 15 club, which is our, you know, which is our greatest asset, but our, you know, could also be our worst enemy. And maybe we could start this, um, this conversation for, for everyone that's out there listening or watching is by a question that one of our uh, audience members had asked. Okay. And I think it might be a great segue into what we're trying to get at because we're trying to solve a problem and which most of us, 
you know, which we all have, and then this really exemplifies that problem. So Joseph asks, says, very often, I feel I talk myself into a bad shot, mm -hmm. especially after a good one. I know this negative attitude is self-destructive. It's difficult for me to picture a good shot and try to execute it. This is often results, this often results in a bad shot. This is what are some of the strategies to avoid the negative feedback. And then also one of the last one, Linda also asked, says, I can play really well when I'm playing casually with friends, but when I play a tournament, I freeze and play poorly. I mean, those are two very similar, but just, you know, different situations. For sure. You know. Well, it, it, the idea behind it is, and, and I called the, the book I just wrote, the 15th club, because the 15th club is your brain, is your mind. And when I talk about the brain and the mind, the brain, think of the brain as the hardware, the mind is the software. So the physical brain is the computer and the body is the printer. Mm -hmm. So as long as the computer is sending correct messages, right, everything sort of operates fairly well. Where the problem comes in is we have two kinds of uh, minds. Our mind is broken up into a subconscious and conscious. Right. And, and humans are the only ones who do this. Animals don't have a conscious mind. They're 100% subconscious. They operate off of programs. And so everything is running for them on an automatic basis. They respond to their current environment in real time. Now, if you read all the self-help books and you read all the golf books, they're going to tell you, stay present, be in the moment. If animals could play golf, they would absolutely dominate the game <laughs> because that's exactly what they do. They're fully present in the moment all the time, right? The only thing they're thinking about is now which is exactly what, you, what we want you doing when you play golf, is only to be focused on what's happening now. But what happens is, is then we maybe missed a putt back on the third hole and we're on the ninth hole and we're still thinking about the third hole. Well, I can guarantee you, your subconscious mind is still on the third hole, still trying to play that hole because it sees everything in real time. So if you think about something or something reminds you about something, your mind sees all of that in real time, your subconscious mind. So if you start thinking about making a bad shot or the bad shot that you made four holes ago, and, and that your mind starts looking at that memory, when does it think that's actually happening? It thinks you're making the bad shot now. Mm. And so then that becomes the dominant thought. So our conscious mind does more to mess us up than our subconscious mind, because our conscious mind is our reasonable, logical part of our brain. And it's operating about 5%, it's this prefrontal lobe. So it's brilliant because it can create and imagine and do all kinds of, it's, it's created the world we live in, computers, automobiles, airplanes, everything that we couldn't do, we figured out a way to do. So that's our conscious mind, right? That's our intellect. Our subconscious mind's running off of programs. It's running everything through your autonomic nervous system, responding in real time. And I, I use usually the metaphor, a zebra cannot feel fear of a lion unless there's a lion present. Zebras aren't sitting around imagining lions. They don't remember the lion chasing them yesterday, right? But if a lion shows up, they absolutely can go into a defensive mode. So we, however, store information about lions. We store billions of bits of information about lions. That's having a major effect on the way we perform in life, not just golf, but overall in life. And our mind is not okay when it sees a threat. It wants a response to it. So that's basically what's happening when people have anxiety and panic attacks is their mind is looking at old data in real time. And how that happens is, let's just say somebody had a, an auto accident, you know, 10 years ago, and they got hit by a white van. Every time their mind sees a white van, it's gonna be looking at that old data about the accident. And then every time they see a white van, their heart starts beating in their chest. And, and they're just sitting at a light looking at a van. They don't know why they're having this feeling, why they're having this anxiety. 
it's because their mind is looking at their subconscious mind is looking at the accident and thinks something's happening. So it's preparing you for a fight or flight response, but there's nothing happening. That's going on for everybody all the time. And, and that's really what our program is able to address and update. So we're going to reset the memory system. And so when we reset the memory system, you can stay more present. Um, so the, the question about why do I um, you know, hit a really good shot and then all of a sudden I start thinking about hitting a bad shot, what was the dominant thought? The bad shot. Right. So now your mind says, what do we know about bad shots? And starts looking at a whole bunch of old data about bad shots. What kind of shot are you going to hit? Chances are a bad shot. And, and that's why the best golfers in the world, I remember you know, hearing Jack Nicklaus talk about this one time. He was saying, you know, in the 1963 U.S. Open at Oakmont, on the 17th hole, I hit a three iron to within four feet. That guy was storing and banking, right, all his best shots. So when he got into another situation that looks similar or same, his mind was not thinking about the bad shots that he hit like that. He was thinking about his best shots that he hit. And, mm -hmm. and Paul, you've gone through the program, so you understand why we do that banking. We want your mind using the resources of your best shots, not your worst shots. And so, so when the, the gentleman who asked that question starts thinking about a bad shot, what's his mind looking at? Shots that didn't didn't work shots that weren't his best shots now that becomes the dominant thought of the way his mind's going to respond to this shot that's what we have to stop right and how do we do that how do we stop that thinking that's thinking thinking you know like we i mean it sounds like you know we have we, you know, one is awareness that we can we, because we're all capable right between whether you're a five handicap or 20 handicap we've had great shots yeah, but we, you know, we hit, we see water. Then it's like all of a sudden, like, oh my God, don't hit it in the water, don't hit it left, don't hit it right, and then we, and so share with us, how, like, what's the beginning, beginning of how to get out of that and how to correct. Well, the the first thing one is to be aware of it. So we know we do it right, and so we're aware that that can happen. So you, the only way to do, it, and that's why I call it the fifteenth club. If if you got a new club today, right and you went out to the range, you're going to have to practice it to get good at it. Chances are you're not going to hit it perfectly when you first start hitting that club. So the same thing with the 15th club. I want you to learn that it's a tool that you can use that you've got to practice. So one of the things that we can do, we've got to control the nervous system. We've got to calm it down. And you can do that several different ways. We can be doing that with breathing. We can be making sure our thought process is staying positive, focusing on your target. Um, stop the thinking process when you're getting ready to hit your shot. So I, I work with uh, one of the PGA players, Louis Gagne. Um, he's playing on the Corn Ferry Tour right now. And we were out playing one day. And you know, I, I go out and I play with them, right? It's very humbling to go and play with these guys it, right? is. it really is i mean they're so good they're just so incredible but anyway so i'm out and i'm making a putt for a birdie on the 11th hole and as i'm getting ready to putt lewis says to me he goes he goes doc what are you thinking about and i stepped back and i said lewis i'm not thinking now right i said i've already made my thought process of what i want to do now I get over the shot and I let my subconscious know it's time for it to play. When your subconscious plays, it just, it knows what to do. It actually sees things much better than you think you do. Hmm. So you can talk yourself out of it. If you let your conscious mind start making thoughts as you're ready to hit this next shot, I'll guarantee it'll tell you that that, you know what, maybe that's two balls out. Maybe that's not a ball and a half out. And for the subconscious mind, it's like, what? We got a problem? There's a lion again? <laughs> and then it starts to dysregulate your nervous system. So you have to be able to intentionally and practice it. And, and like the, the lady, I forget what you said her name was, who said that when she plays with her friends. Uh, Linda, she was saying when she, played, when she plays casually, yes. Yeah. 
So okay. it's easy to do it when you're playing casually, right? Because there's no real pressure. So you're not thinking very much. As soon as you get into a tournament, what do you start doing? Overthinking, right? What if this goes wrong? Oh my gosh, if I, you know, if I shank this ball or, you know, I, I don't want to get a triple bogey and all of a sudden it becomes all about what can go wrong. And if you start thinking about what can go wrong, you set your mind off into another direction. And then it becomes all about, you know, the dangers on the golf course. There really are no dangers on a golf course, right? But your mind sees danger as danger. So if you think about water as being dangerous, even though you're not thinking it directly, but you start feeling fear about hitting the ball because I got to now carry this ball, you know, 200 yards over the water. Now, all of a sudden, your mind starts saying water is dangerous, and then it becomes focused on what else is dangerous. And it changes the way. So we basically have four brainwave states. We have beta, alpha, theta, and delta. Beta is about 15 to 30 hertz or cycles per second. The mind is pretty active. It's cycling pretty fast, taking in a lot of data. When you go into alpha, alpha is between 7 and 14 hertz. That's where the mind is very focused and relaxed. And that's why I said I get the golfers to learn how to play in alpha because their heart rate slows down, their attention becomes very intense and focused, and they can perform at a better level because they're not bringing in anything except what they're doing now. And that's why I said when I when I texted Tim when he was in the finals in the first event, he wrote back alpha, baby, alpha. He was in alpha brainwave state and he knew it. Right. And, and it, it, one of the things uh, that I'd like to share, Dr. Wood, is that we've all played in alpha at some point. We have like, sure. but we just don't even know that it's happening. Right. But the great thing about love about this is that we now that we have this information, we can practice playing in alpha. For sure. Right? And We've that, all experienced, yeah, sorry. Like we all experienced like, how did I do that? This is awesome. I had the best round. I didn't even know how I did it. Like, like, wow, you were in alpha. Yeah. And we call that in sports, we call that flow. That's the flow state. And if you're in that flow state, your subconscious mind knows how to play. You have rehearsed over and over and over on the range how to hit that golf ball. Your mind knows exactly how to repeat that swing. The only time it's not going to do that is if there's so many thoughts running through your mind. If your conscious mind starts playing and not your subconscious mind, your conscious mind is nowhere near as good as your subconscious. Yeah. Your it's subconscious crazy. is perfect. It can play exactly the way it needs to play. It's crazy. Tyler just goes, this sounds like the same reason why most of us can look like a pro in the driving range, but not on the golf course. Yep. Because as soon as you bring in tension, you change everything in the system. Yeah. Physiologically, psychologically, tension is not good for a golf swing at all. You know, just think about it. When you get on, you know, you make a bad shot. What do you do? The next time you're going to hit a ball, you're so mad, you grip the club even tighter and <laughs> swing even harder and it generally never works out very well, right? So uh, the game is a game of relaxation and tension release, no tension. So you need to constantly, um, you know, teach and practice that, men you know, mental energy. And, and you can do it. Everybody can do it. The pros do it really well, but they even have times where they slip out of it. And so that's the purpose of what, we do, and Paul, you know the program, is I give you tools to bring it back so that you can then stop the mind because the mind learns to respond, right, to certain stimuli. And as long as it sees that stimuli, it calms it down. So I have the, the golfers learn this as well because it's natural at times to start drifting off, especially in golf, right? Even for the pros. I mean, they hit a shot and then they walk for five minutes. Right. And there's a lot of stuff to start thinking about. And uh, but that's not going to be in their best interest. They want to be able to keep their nervous system regulated, especially when they hit the shot. Um, and that's why I said to Lewis, I said, just calm it down. Quiet your mind. Don't think you already know what you need to do when you step over. You've already made your thought process. Right. OK, I think this is a ball and a half out. I think. You know, it's going to be slow, it's a little uphill, or it's downhill, whatever it is. You've made your calculations. And then when you get over the shot, 
you need to feel that mind quiet down. Now, we can do it. Everybody can do it. Everybody who's played golf here can do it, right? And you've done it at times, right? And that's when you just, like, as I said in the book, play out of your mind, right? You don't want that conscious mind coming in, right, and interfering with what you already know how to do. You've spent hours on a, on a range learning how to hit a golf ball. Yeah. Oh, and I'd like to go over a couple of things. And I got some people ask some more questions here, which is amazing. Says that like uh, Jeffrey goes, I'm surprised that the word visualization, visual, visualization has not been uttered yet or positive imagery. And I get, we'll get to that, uh, Jeffrey. Great uh, question there. But there is visualization, I believe, and, uh, and positive imagery. But I think yesterday, we did, the other day, we talked about confidence and intention. You know, how confidence is like, you know, when we play confidently, like in your, in, uh, and share with what you said about confidence, which was like, I didn't even think about that. Uh, whenever I work with a professional, the first thing I'll ask, one of the first things I'll ask him is, do you think you need to be confident to play good golf? Mm -hmm. And I typically get the same response. Well, yeah, I think it's good for me. And I said, what if I told you, you don't need confidence to play good golf? And they'll say, I don't need confidence. I said, no, you don't. You have a skill. You're amongst the top in the world at what you do, right? Confidence is a byproduct of your skill. Confidence builds when you execute your skill. If you put confidence in front of your skill, I will guarantee you your confidence will leave you. Confidence only hangs around when you're playing good. When you're not playing good, it leaves, right? And so if you start thinking, I got to get my confidence back in order to play, what I, what I say to these professionals is I said, there isn't any shot you can't hit on a golf course. You can hit the ball into the woods and hit a ball in between two trees, six inches apart and get back on a green, right? Tiger Woods was the greatest of all time at that. He didn't hit straight shots all the time. He got into trouble all the time, but he was so good at getting out of trouble. I mean, golf is a game of recovery and that's the whole thing. Everybody thinks I've got to hit the ball. How many fairways did I hit? How many greens did I hit? But if you really look at the best players, they're, they're just so good at scrambling. That's where they make up all their shots, right? We all hit good shots. We all hit greens. We're all putting for birdies at times. The difference is, is that when we miss a green that can turn into a double bogey as opposed to, you know, those guys get up and down all the time. So they recover better than anybody. That's where they make, and they make those 10, 15 foot putts, right? That we can three putt. And right. um, so confidence is not their friend. Confidence is what happens after you execute your skills. So get confidence out of your mind that you need it because you don't. And so Lewis, I'll give you a great example. Lewis um, first worked with me. The very first tournament he went to after working with me was he needed a place in the top 20 in this tournament to make final stage of Q school for the corn Ferry tour. And so he went through the, the program with me after three rounds, he's leading by five shots. He's playing great. He goes into the very fir the first tee shot of the fourth round hits the ball out of bounds right? Which is the worst time you want to hit that ball out of bounds, right? So anyway, his caddy looks at him and says, Lewis, are you really smiling right now? And he says, yeah, I just heard Dr. Wood in my head said, your confidence and your ball just went out of bounds. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you have skill, just rely on your skill. You're not going to do that twice in a row. He's too skilled to have that happen. But if he starts thinking about it again, right? Then his mind's going to have that as a dominant thought. And that's going to affect his swing. All he has to do is quiet his mind, hit the ball down the middle again, which is exactly what he did. For some of us that are not professionals, that don't have quite that elevated skill set, right? So we're, I'm a 15 handicap, I'm a 20 handicap, an average golfer, right? And I think one of the things that you mentioned is like, we have to trust our skill set. Is that still true for us that are 15 handicaps or 20 handicaps? For sure. Because you still know how to do, you've got some skill, you're out on a golf course, even if you're a 15 or 20 handicap, most people aren't even that good, right? The average person is shooting, you know, in the hundreds, right? right. So you tend to hang around people that are more in your sort of skill set. So it feels like, you know, that you're not as good maybe as sometimes as you really are. So 
15 or 20 is still going to be shooting, you know, in the 80s, 90s, right? Mm -hmm. On your best day, right? That's a that's not a terrible score, especially if that's not what you do for a living, right? And the the great part about that is you can take a 20 down to a 10 really quick, right? It's very oh. hard to take a two down to a scratch, right? Right. Because the margin of error is so much less. And then you take these professionals. I mean, it's insane what it takes to get, you know, a quarter of a stroke off of their game. It's, it's tremendous. I, for me, I would think that like this mindset that we have, like of negativity or I'm going to hit a bad shot. That I'm not sure what you would, how we would, how you would call that is that um, it probably has got to represent 25, 30% of our, 40% of our game. Yeah. Our, our brains tend to be negatively biased, right? We're, because of experiences in our life. So we have a negative bias set up already. And then if you start playing golf and you start having problems out on a golf course, you start struggling on a golf course, it's very easy for it to go even further negative. So you have to train it. Your 15th club is just like any other club in your bag. If you allow it, to go that way it'll continue to go that way you've got to deliberately intentionally start focusing and changing that when you first started it's going to be a little more difficult just like any new club that you're starting to hit you have to become intentional about it and you have to accept that there's going to be some learning curve on how to do it but i'll tr uh, trust me if you practice it and you learn it you will take strokes off your game just with that because how many times, I mean, Paul, how many times have you been out on a golf, on a golf range hitting golf balls? Hundreds. Lots. Lots. Right? When's the last time you worked on your brain? The 15th club? No, wait, never. Well, now I have. I'm now I have, you have. Yeah. I now I do. Yes. But we never really do. Even the pros. Like when I talk with the pros, a lot of the times, you know, the sports psychologists will tell them. It's pretty much the same thing. Stay present, be in the moment, blah, 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 blah. All the things that make sense that they know naturally. Yes. But, How do we do that? That's that. the thing. Yeah. Like we need tools to do that. We know that. It's like, yeah, we eat health. Yeah. But what, what do we do? So what I'd love to do now is that it's like uh, 1030. It's um, just a few more that I'd love to open up for Q&A for people to ask you directly themselves any questions that they may have. If that's OK with you. Sure. So maybe just like in the next few minutes, just uh, kind of share like what the process looks like. We get to the first tee, we, you know, we've been on the range, you know, we're doing well on the range and then we get to the first tee and then just can maybe give us some high level of, you know, what, what it would look like. So one of the easiest things to do is breathing okay. because when we get stressed out, we start shallow breathing. When you start shallow breathing, your heart rate starts to speed up. So your system goes into an activation mode. It wants to start getting more oxygen into your system. Um, so a breathing method is very, very simple to do. You want to get lots more, a lot, a lot more oxygen into your system before you hit, and you can practice it before you get up there. So when you go up, we have a tendency when we're playing in a foursome, chit-chatting, yakking, talking, right? And then we walk up and put our ball down. Then my buddy says something behind me, right? And then I'm commenting. Then I stand up and try to hit the ball. And all of a sudden, everything starts to tense up, right? Step back. Stop talking to your buddies for a second. And if they don't like that, you have to tell them, like, I'm working on something here, right? Step back and do a five, six, seven breathing method. So what you want to do first, and this is really important, exhale all the air in your lungs first, because first. you want to be able to get a maximum breath in. So you exhale everything first, breathe in through your nose for five seconds, uh, hold it for six seconds, and then exhale for seven seconds. And you're better to exhale out of your nose than your mouth, right? So exhale out of your nose, because what happens is we get nitrous oxide in our system, in our nasal and that allows us to absorb more oxygen. If you breathe out through your mouth, right, you don't get that same uh, ability. So in and out through your nose is a better way to do it. Um, so that's one simple thing. Locate your target on the golf course, like wherever you're thinking you'd like to hit it. So visualization and or imagery or? 
imagery, you can visualize your shot, whatever you want to do, but also pick out the actual spot that you want to hit it on. And the more um, accurate you can be with that, the better. So if you just say, oh, I want to hit the fairway, that becomes a pretty wide target, right? The more you can narrow it down, the better. Uh, one of the things that I thought was a great lesson Jack Nicholas talked about is that he would pick a spot in front of the tee. Maybe it's a piece of grass. Um, it could be a little burnt out area or something like that. That became his target line. So he wanted to hit the ball over that target. And that target is lined up with his target out further out. So it's a really simple little technique because you're thinking about, you're going to hit a ball two or 300 yards down a fairway, right? You got to get it started on the right path. Right. Right. So that's a good way to do that. So quiet everything down. The breathing is a good way. Pick out your target, visualize what you want to do. So I know somebody talked about, I'm a big, big believer in visualization, not just on the golf course. I believe you should be visualizing all the time. So even after you uh, come back after a round or even before round, the night before round, visualize your swing. The more your mind sees the swing, the more it becomes ingrained. You can actually improve your game without hitting a golf ball just through visualization. Oh. No way. Your mind doesn't know the difference between real or imagined. So if you actually practice and visualize making that swing, seeing yourself hit those shots, because your mind learns to code, our brains are coding all the time for us. So how, does, how do you build a code, right? You repeat it over and over. You're writing code. So if you can't get to a golf course, you can still get almost as good it's not quite as good as going out and hitting but it's almost as good as hitting golf balls visualizing yourself hitting golf balls it also takes a lot less wear and tear right, right. on your system right so we get let's get back to the first thing so we're on the tee we we do the breathing exercise which is extremely important to calm the nervous system down we're visualizing yeah. we narrow the target and now we stepping up now we got to execute damn it <laughs> yep but that's where you want to feel the comps. So if you have a lot of oxygen in your system, it's impossible for your nervous system to feel afraid. If you've got lots of oxygen, it calms it down automatically, which is going to help calm down the thought process. The thought process comes in when the mind starts to get worried about something. Like, wow, well, you know, I, just, I don't want to hit the ball in the woods. You know, I want to make sure I hit the fairway. I want to do this. I, I don't want to do this. Your subconscious particularly doesn't understand negation. So it doesn't hear don't, won't, can't, shouldn't, right? It hears it literally. Your subconscious is literal. So if you say don't hit the ball in the water, it hears hit the ball in the water. It doesn't understand negation at all, gotcha. right? So you have to be intentional in what you want to do. The more you can focus it on that target, the better. Pick out a really good line. And then feel, right, your system, you want to, and this is something you have to practice to learn it. You'll start to recognize how you calm your system down just standing over that ball. You want to feel that quiet. Now, I'm about a seven handicap. So when I go out and I play, I was playing in a tournament, I literally don't get nervous on a golf course anymore at all. And that's not an exaggeration. That's the, the truth. I don't worry about a particular kind of shot. I don't care what the shot is, how difficult it is. I've learned to quiet my system down. It doesn't mean I can execute every single time because I'm not as good as a, as a pro, right? So I'm going to make more mistakes than they're going to make. Um, but I remember I was playing in this one, we were playing in a match play tournament and we we're on the eighth hole. I was tied with the guy and the pin was tucked right behind the bunker um, on a par three. And I went right at it and I stuck it to about six feet. And my opponent says to me, he says, wow, really gutsy shot, right? Going after that pin and I, right, like going after that pin right over the bunker. And I said to him, I said, you know what? I didn't even think about a bunker. And that was the truth. If I had thought about the bunker, right? Even if I had said, oh, I want to go after the pin. I just don't want to make, get into that bunker. I would have been thinking about the bunker. I was only thinking about the pin. 
and I, and I was able to execute. Like, I'm not going to do that 100% of the time, but I have a better chance of doing it if my mind can stay on the target without thinking about anything else. Right. So here's a great analogy, right? And we, we, we take this approach and we don't execute. Now we have to hit our next shot. Yeah. Knowing that we didn't execute the last one. <laughs> yeah. So walk us through that part of it because that's probably really important. Like, okay, damn it, I just hit a bad shot even though I went through this whole process yep. of breathing, focusing, intention, quieting the conscious mind and, and trusting your skill. Yep. Here's one of the things you're going to love. This is one of the things that the pros I work with love it, right? They hadn't heard this before. What I tell them is I want you to develop an attitude of becoming outcome blind. And what I mean by that is you become blind to whatever the outcome was. Because if you start focusing on the outcome of that shot, your mind is going to want to hold it and fix it because it's going to want to think about it again and think about what did I do wrong? You start looking at the swing. How did I miss that? Did I, you know, whatever you did. I, I learned that from, and I, and I put this in the book, Becoming Outcome Blind. It really came from a professional poker player, Annie Duke, who's a female professional poker player. When she was being interviewed one time, I found this article and I was like, this is so brilliant. She said the secret to her success was developing an outcome blind attitude. So, and what she said was, when I'm playing a hand, I know what I've got in my hand. I know what cards I've already played. I know what cards the other players have already played, but I don't know what's in the deck and I don't know what's in their hands. So based on my skill at my level, I have to make a decision. And so I'll make a decision that either go in or, or fold or whatever. She says, but after I've made that decision, if I lose the hand or win the hand, she says, I become outcome blind to it because I couldn't have done it any different based on what I knew. So I accept that. I'm blind to the outcome. I'm good enough that I'm going to win more than I'm going to lose. And if you can at, take that attitude is you're going to have a bad shot. The pros oh. have bad shots. But when I talk to the pros that I work with, that's maybe one of their favorite things that they hear. They said, I've never heard that. I love that. And I said, so, you know, you're going for the green in two, you know, on a par five and you hit the ball right, right? And now you're off the green, right? So what? You can get up and down from off the green. You do it all the time. You hit the ball on the bunker. Bunkers aren't even a penalty for you guys, right? <laughs> they can put the ball in the hole from the bunker. They sometimes like being in a bunker, right? That's outcome blind. I love one of the things that you just mentioned earlier is that golf is about recovery, right? Like we were, we're playing a recovery game, like not down the middle game. We every shot's a recovery shot, basically. It is. Yeah. And, and that's what you have to accept. So there's the, one of the answers to what you just asked is, you know, yeah, you thought everything was going to go great. You have it all lined up. It feels really good. And then all of a sudden the ball ends up, you know, 20 yards off of the fairway or 20 yards off of the green, right? Oh, well, right. I got to recover from there now. And I, and I don't know about you, but this is the attitude I certainly have. I sometimes love those kinds of shots, right? Now, if I was playing for my living, I probably wouldn't be too excited, but, but when I get one of those opportunities to make a great shot, um, I was sharing with someone, I don't know if it was you, I was sharing with somebody the other day is, one of my favorite shots of all time was I was playing on a, on a nine, on the 10th hole uh, of a club. I hit the ball way right onto the ninth fairway over the trees onto the ninth fairway. And well, in fact, it was in the pine straw on the right side. And I was like, Oh my gosh, it was all trees, but happened to be where I was. There was an opening about the size of half a window through the trees and my partners couldn't even hear me. Right. So I was trying to yell, keep an eye on the ball, right? And they couldn't hear me. So I took a, a pitching wedge and I punched it right through that hole. It was a perfect shot. It went right through that hole. I had no idea where it went. I drove all the way around. I said, anybody see the ball? And like, nobody even knew I was hitting it. I found it on the left side of the fairway in a bunker. And it was about 150 yards out. 
And so I hit my next shot and I stuck it to about two feet, made my par, right? I love making those kinds of shots. So instead of getting frustrated, take it as an opportunity to improve your skills about recovery. And you, what I do is I bank those shots. You know the process, Paul, right? Yeah, you might want to share that banking. Yeah. So one of the things that that I do is I, and I share with everybody is when you have another great shot or you do something really well, you want to visualize it and bank it so that that now becomes a resource. And that's why I was saying about Jack Nicklaus, that guy's banked thousands and tens of thousands of shots. Those now become his resource on how to do it again. So if, if I got into another situation like that about hitting the ball through a little tiny opening and a bunch of trees, like it was bushes, it wasn't trees, it was bushes, right? I'm going to go, oh, good, here's another chance to do it, right? What's the worst that's going to happen? I put it right into the trees, have to take a drop, I end up with a you know quad, right? But that's not the end of the day. Um, so practice those shots, become good at those shots and accept them right? And then start figuring out a way to just bank them so that they become your tools for the next time you get into another situation like that. And sometimes those are my favorite, you know, times I'll come back after a round and I may not have played my best round, but I remember those kinds of shots and that becomes what I, I, I talk about. It, fascinating. So we get to our shot, we're practicing our breathing, we narrow our target, we calm our nervous system. We just trust our skill, not confidence, because confidence is, you know, a friend right. that comes and goes. Yeah. And you know, we if we start, because I've noticed this happened to me that I go through this, and then all of a sudden, the negative thought comes back into my head, like either from the last hole that I just hit a bad shot, or the last shot that I hit bad, or an upcoming consequence that I have to face. Right. So that what we what do we do there and that in that when that negative thought you know when that thought that conscious thought comes up step back reset reset right? reset because if you don't reset and you just get up there and you just say well you know i don't want to hold up this, you know the foursome i don't want to get anybody you know frustrated uh, doesn't matter just reset step back i mean you see the pros do it every once in a while you know if there's a camera clicks Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, you remember Tiger, he'd be like oh. on his downswing, right? Then a camera would click and he could stop his club. I mean, that because he knew if he tried to hit that ball, if he continued that swing, it was not going to be good. That camera click is the same thing as a thought that's not beneficial, right? Beneficial, appealing, possible thoughts. Mm-hmm. That's what you want to have. You don't want to have thoughts when you're ready to hit a ball. You want to have your thoughts before you're ready to hit your ball. And then when you stand over your shot, you want your mind to be clear in alpha, just focused on this shot. That's it. And let your subconscious do what it knows how to do that you've spent hours practicing on a, on a range for. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, I'd like to see if anybody in the audience has any questions that they'd like to ask and talk to Dr. Wood themselves. Uh, raise your hand there and Paige, you can maybe help orchestrate that uh, yeah any questions if they anyone ask? has any questions they can go and put in the chat directly. or if they want to ask directly you can go ahead give the platform this yeah to do so yeah oh, oh, okay here we go is that do we have somebody yep this is just brilliant so many light bulbs going off going off perfect and like i said the best the best advice i can give you is just understand that golf is a game constant game of recovery right nobody gets it perfect even the greatest players in the world you know a lot of times they're just they're not having their best day i'll give you another example i had one of my other garrett reban um he's on the pga tour um he said to me he, he shot five under, seven under on uh, Thursday, Friday. On Saturday, he shot one under. And then, so this is about a month ago. And he called me up on uh, Saturday night. And he, said, he says, Dr. Wood, I want to just share something with you. He says, I didn't have my best stuff today. 
He says, I was really like, just didn't feel it. It wasn't feeling real comfortable. I just couldn't get comfortable. And he says, and I, and I said, well, you played okay. I mean, one under still, you know, decent round. He goes, that would have been a five or six over round had I not done your program. He says, I know it. He says, I was able to play better than I was really feeling like I was going to play because I could calm everything down. He says, but I would have just been unwound before. Um, and Tim Burke said the same thing. And the very first tournament that he played, he said, I would have been knocked out of that first tournament. He says, because I hit two really bad shots in a row. Now, this, this is one of the greatest players in the world. He had two wild drives in a row on the long drive championships. And, he, and this is in the early rounds. He says, before, he says, I would have then been going, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. Okay, change my driver, change my grip, do something different. He would have started trying to make all these different adjustments. And what he did was he was able to then reset. He says, I did what you showed me how to do. I reset. He says, and then I started striping the ball back down the middle again. And it was really funny because when I watched it on the Monday night on the golf channel, right, he, he was standing there and he just had a golf ball in his hand and he's just rolling the golf ball. And the, the golf uh, channel announcers are going, Tim looks really different. Like, what's different about Tim? There's something definitely changed about him. And he wasn't sitting there watching the other guy hit golf balls. He wasn't stressed out where before he would have been, right? Now his wife was a mess. <laughs> she, was, she looked <laughs> like she was like really struggling. They kept showing her and she's fretting and, and, and he's just sitting there rolling a golf ball in his hand. And the producer or director or whatever on the show came up to Tim before the final round. He says, okay, Tim, you know how this works. Like, come on out in front of the crowd, fire them up, get them all pumped up. You know, you know what to do. And Tim goes, yeah, I don't do that anymore. Because <laughs> <laughs> he was trying to keep his nervous system regulated. He didn't want to be jumping up and down and pumping his fists and everything. He wanted to keep his nervous system regulated. And that's what he was able to do. And he said, that's what changed everything for him. Because once he learned how to do it, right, he could continue to do it. That, funny you mentioned that. I notice a lot of tour players don't play in the excitement state. Mm -mm, it's not good. It's not it's, good. No, no, because you're going to get, you know, it's not like football, right? You want to get pumped up. Golf is a game. It's a cerebral game. So that's why the 15th club is the most important club in your bag. It either is going to be your best club or your worst club. And so if you can make it your best, and what I say to the pros is when you can make the 15th club as good as your 14 clubs, that's when it all comes together because then you can execute under all those times. So Justin Lauer, he's playing on the PGA tour right now. Justin, after going through our program, had a 10th place and he just last week had an eighth place finish. Those are his two best finishes on the PGA wow. tour. So he has to get in the top 125 in order to get his card for next year. So I think right now um, he's pretty close. He, he may, he may be able to do it. So I think they got four more tournaments left. So, but again, it's the same thing, right? I'm, I'm not making Justin a better golfer. He's already a great golfer. He just needed to get that system, keep it regulated. It's, it's just amazing how our mind just sometimes works so against us. For sure. You saw our worst enemy. It's like, it's like, um, just, it, it's, it's unbelievable. Just being aware that these are just thoughts. There is no, there is no 911. There is no danger. Right. It's not real. Like, I mean, like we put this danger on ourselves and we can just then play it. Like just play. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So again, I, I look back and I look at some of the, in that match play tournament I was playing at our club, um, I was playing against this one guy. I had to give him, I think it was five strokes. And um, so on the sixth hole, I hit my ball right and it hit the card path and ended up in the bushes, but it ended up about waist high in the bushes. And it was just sitting there in there. And so I have to give him a stroke on this hole. So he has his ball. He's right down the middle, right? So he was even further back. So he hit his next shot. He's on the green. And so I'm like, 
if I take a drop, now I'm hitting three. He's already on the green and two, and, you know, and I have to give him a stroke. I don't have a choice. So I took my club out like a baseball bat, like a hockey stick, really, yeah. right? And I just decided, so he filmed it because he, he was thinking, I can't believe this guy's going to try to hit this shot, <laughs> right? And I just took it, right? And I swung and I hit it and I hit it to about two feet from the green. And, <laughs> and he filmed it and he goes, that was unbelievable, right? And so my next shot, I chip up, I make my par, he three putts and no. I have the hole, right? And those are the kinds of things that just crush you know, in a match play, those are really, and so I'll just continue. So what happened from there is we went on to the seventh, eighth hole, right? Um, we were still tied, went on to the ninth hole. I have to give him a shot on the ninth hole. And I end up in the bunker on the right on two. He's on the green, plus he gets a shot. And um, so I, I just jokingly turned around and I said, I'm going to have to put this ball in the hole if I have a chance on this hole, right, from the bunker, if I don't sink it from the bunker, right? And again, he he's so rattled now, he three putts, right? <laughs> and I win the hole, right. right? Now, you look at that, right, and those were two bad shots, yet that actually won or tied a hole and won a hole for me, Right. That's the way you need to look at sometimes those bad shots. That's not the end of it. It's just an opportunity to recover again. And, and the one thing that I do say that I do really well is I recover really well. Gotcha. But I think it's because I stay present. It's fascinating. Uh, there's somebody just asked a great question. So Len asked, um, our club championship is a two-day tournament. After day one, you find yourself out in front or in a good position. Any suggestions for quieting the mind uh, all night until the next tee shot? That's kind of fascinating. You're in the tournament, you're in the lead, you're up on the leaderboard, and now the nerves, like, what the hell did we do with this information? Great question, Len. Great question. I love that. Here's what I, I would do. I would replay the round that I just led the tournament in. I'd visualize that entire round. I do that all the time. So play it again in your mind, right? So you're not thinking about tomorrow, right? You're then recalling what you did really well. And I'm, I'm talking about the good shots, all the shots, replay it and see yourself because what are you visualizing yourself doing? Leading the tournament. You just need to do the same thing tomorrow. So the reason I say all the shots is because if you just visualize your best shots right before the tournament, right? You also have to visualize the recoveries you made or the up and downs you made or all of those shots. And you realize, so this is why this is important. Let's just say you had two bad holes, right? But you're still leading the tournament. What do you just learn? I can have a bad hole. I can have two bad holes and I can still lead the tournament. So like, your, your, your mind is seeing yourself winning and coming back and, and being able to do that all the time. That's great. Nothing you can't do. Right? And so the visualization, I do, it, I do it before I go to bed. So as I'm trying to go to sleep, I'll just visualize myself playing that round again. That's wonderful. Len, I hope that, how that, uh, that answer from Dr. Wood helps you with that uh, situation. That's amazing. Um, God, I just had a thought and I forgot. Um, this has been well, well, let me let me share one thing here. This is, yeah. I think, another good thing. This is in the book, right? I, and I call it "What's in a Name," right? This shows you how powerful the subconscious mind is when you play golf. Could you argue that the three maybe most important golfers in the history of golf were Tiger, Jack, and Arnie? Right? They had more influence. Arnie first, then Jack, then Tiger. Right? A lot of other great golfers in there. But if you take Tiger, Jack, and Arnie, what do they all have in common? They all have symbols in their names. Tiger, Jack is the golden bear, Arnie's the king, right? That was a psychological advantage. Arnie's the king, Jack is the golden bear, Tiger is Tiger. How many times did Tiger win a tournament because people just folded? Right. right? 
Tigers charging. We're being chased down by the tiger, right? The golden bear. I mean, that's a visual that not only did he feel psychologically, but his opponents felt too. And I remember uh, the thing that shocked me one time is I heard Matt Kuchar. Somebody asked him, do you remember the first time you ever played with Tiger? Now, Matt Kuchar is a pretty accomplished golfer. And what Matt says is, oh, I remember that. He says, my hands were shaking so bad, I didn't think I'd be able to keep the golf ball on the tee. <laughs> Tiger's already leading by four strokes <laughs> before he tees the ball up. Right? That's psychological. So you need to develop that in your own mind. Keep your own sort of visual or sort of symbol of what you want to see, who you are, right? And it just it just works. That's fantastic. And, and Dr. Wood, listen, for anyone uh, who would like to even work with you at a more intimate level, um, yep. what does that look like? I mean, how do they reach you? And because you are just an awesome, listen, I, I've spent, you know 40 years with panic attacks and then like you know and going and finding people that have i've never across you know therapy and so on and but and how much it's helped me on my golf game too it's it's just unbelievable so um i have vetted doctor with myself I, uh, and it's been an amazing turnaround in my life um and if anybody would like to work with him uh, let them know what that looks like dr wood yeah, just check out our site. It's the inspiredperformanceinstitute.com. Uh, just check it out. You can go in there, see all the testimonials. I know Tim Burke's in there. I think you're going to have some more golfers in there. But people who have gone through panic attacks, Boston Marathon bombing survivors, this works on trauma, and then trauma improves performance. So you may not have had those kinds of traumas, but you could have business trauma. You could have childhood trauma. Believe it or not, that affects your golf game. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't think so, but it does because those old memories keep looping at the same time and that can have an effect on your nervous system. So when you're out there playing around to golf, your mind could be thinking about, you know what? I always fold every time I get under pressure. You know, those thoughts can start coming into your head from previous experiences in your lifetime. And then what's the dominant thought coming in? And so everybody just without ever swinging a golf club if you just take some of these things in you can improve right your golf game for sure and, and i'm going to give you a, I, i'm going to share my opinion on something that is very uh, uh just in my opinion with regards to taking lessons right mm -hmm. and we, i i'm victim of this i you know i want to become a better golfer i take a lesson yeah and that's i think that's part of the problem is that taking a lesson is part of the problem you shouldn't get, you ought not to get lessons. You ought to find a coach. But what coaches and teachers don't, these professionals don't do is they don't teach this part of it. They teach a technical part of it, like how to put your heads in this position, how to swing, but and like, how do we continuously try to repeat it and, and then in, like develop that technical skill set, but really banking it to become part of our into our of our game because we know we practice it and then all of a sudden a week later we're gonna we can't even remember what we just got taught right so what was the whole point of taking a lesson yep. didn't absolutely squat and there's where the visualization can help you though so if you take a lesson and then you don't go out and, or you go out and play that day but then you don't play for another week or two yeah, you've probably forgotten it. So how, if you say, well, I'm really busy, I couldn't get back out to the golf course for a week or two, how do you improve it? You visualize it. Right. That's the golf course in your mind, right? You don't even have to pay a cart fee for that. Right? That's, yeah. that's free. So I would just practice that. Practice it even in your home, right? Just to swing, stand in front of a mirror, right? And check the swing out. If you have somebody that knows anything about golf, you can have them, I mean, why does Tiger Woods have a coach, right? Because he can't see some of the things that he's doing wrong. It takes somebody else to point it out. No, you just, you know, you close that club head about two degrees at the top of your swing. He doesn't feel that, you know, sneak in. So um, I'll give you one thing that would be a good thing to sort of uh, finalize as well. I remember I bought some new clubs. This is about four years ago, maybe five, four or five years ago. So I bought some new clubs 
um, and I was going to go play and I was playing with my friend and the next day. So I said to him, I said, Jim, I said, I'm not going to keep score today. You can keep score. Like, that's fine. I said, I'm practicing. The, the pro gave me this one little tip that he wanted me to work on. So I'm going to try to focus on that tip. I said, so I'm not worried about score. And he goes, okay, now Jim's never beat me, right? So he desperately wants to beat me. So I'm playing and all of a sudden I realized he's marking my score now. And I said, Jim, don't worry about my score. Just play your game, right? Well, and he goes, oh yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Right, we get to nine. I notice he's still marking my score now. And I said to him, I said, Jim, I said, let me tell you why I don't want you to write my score down. Because if you write my score down, I'm going to start focusing on my score and maybe I'm going to lose. And then I'm going to go back to my old swing. I said, the only way I can ingrain this new swing is to not be worried about the outcome. I have to be able to groove it in. And I said, as long as my mind starts thinking about I'm in danger because I'm going to lose or I'm going to, I said, I'll start going back to the old swing. I said, so just stop marking my score, right? And he wasn't trying to do it, you know, with any ill intent. It was just he wanted to win. But that is how intense you have to practice. One of the other things I do, I don't know if you've done it, but I love playing this game, especially if I want to really, um, you know, focus before a tournament. I play my own two ball. So I'll go out and I'll play two balls and then I pick my best shot and I play from there. So it's my own little two ball scramble. When I play a two ball scramble, I can shoot six, seven under. So wow. what am I telling my mind? It's a few shots that are costing me all my strokes, right? If I get that extra shot, I've got the skill to do it, right? So it's those other shots that are sometimes coming in and make me a bogey when I really could have made a par, right? or I make a par when I had a chance for a birdie. But if I get two putts at that, right? A lot of times I can make it on the second putt. Right. My, my son calls that player Bubba. Bubba. Bubba should be on tour. <laughs> Bubba should be on tour. Bubba should be oh. on tour. Bubba, the second golfer is phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Oh, one of the things that we forgot to talk about, that we forgot, uh, or that I forgot, is like bad shots. Okay, so... One of the things that was really helpful to me is that you that you shared with me, uh, which was a wonderful tip, is that you're going to hit X amount of bad shots per round. Right. So when you hit a bad shot, why get why get aggravated? It's one. It's one. I mean, you already know that you're going to have you know 20 bad shots or th- you know whatever whatever that number is. If you're a 10 handicap, you're going to probably have at least 10 bad shots. Right. Right. That's just and that's what's going to cost you. The difference is the pros maybe have. Two or three. Arnold Palmer said he expected to make seven bad shots around. Now his bad shots are missing the green by five feet, right? Right. But but for us, right, the, the average golfer, right, we're gonna make bad shots. But that's why I love playing the two ball because I realize if I make a bad shot and I get a second chance at that, mm-hmm. I have the skill, right? Right. But I'm going to make some bad shots because I haven't spent right? The amount of time that these pros have, but I can make all those shots. So that's fantastic. I mean, let's just cl- in closing. Um, if anybody has any more questions to ask, and I'll, we're pressed a little bit with time. So breathing, right? Mm-hmm. Narrow the target. If a bad thought comes up, reset. Reset for sure. Right? And then if we hit the bad shot, we just accept it because we already know that we're going to hit a certain amount of bad shots per round. Outcome blind. Outcome blind. Yep. And that I think will tremendously improve our game like instantaneously without yeah. having to take a lesson. Without even having to take a lesson without having to hit a shot. Yeah. And trust our skill set. Yep. Right. Uh, confidence, throw that out the window. Yep. It's, it's well, just there for a ride and and yep. and abandons us when we Yep. It's a fair weather friend. It's a fair weather <laughs> friend, right? <laughs> And just trust our skill set. Like we got this, we know what we do, and just allow the subconscious to take over. So you think about it, let's just say you're a 10 handicap. Chances are that means you're going to probably shoot low 80s, right? If you if you hit on your handicap. So if you go and play with somebody who shoots, who's a 30 handicap, right? You're going to look pretty good to them, right? 
So trust your skill as a 10 handicap that you can play to that handicap. If you want to improve and get better, you have to get your handicap down just with experience. That's just repetition. That's the only way you can do it. And so, but if you're a 10, take pride in being a 10, right? And doing your best to get it to a nine, get it to an eight, get it to a seven, right? And you can move from a 10 to a five a lot easier than you can move from a five to a, a, a scratch. And Dr. Wood, if I'm asking this for myself, if you, by practicing this mindset and using the 15 tool, how, like, what's the expectation of progression? Like, like this should do more. If you work on that, what I call the 15 club, you work on that, you'll improve faster than anything else you've ever done. Right. Uh, you could go out and hit golf balls for the next six months and you won't do as much as you will as if you develop just this mindset oh. it should take off strokes depending on how big your handicap is you know like i said for the pros you know we're trying to get them into so justin lauer has a 10th place finish and an eighth place finish that's his two best finishes so far on tour his first year right that is a big move for him right so Eventually, that just continues to get better, right? I'm not going to be surprised at all to see Justin win a tournament, you know, in the in the next six months to a year. He could do that, but he's playing against the elite of the elite, <laughs> so it's not that easy to move the needle for those guys. But for a 10 or 15 handicap to move down to a seven or eight handicap, you can absolutely do it just with your mind, right? Without even hitting a golf ball. Wow. I just want to share this. Somebody left a wonderful comment. Says this, um, Mike. I think Mr. Johnson said this. I could be Miss Johnson. I don't know for sure, but this was beyond amazing. It all okay. makes so much sense. It says thanks, Paul, for setting up the setting this up for Dr. Wood, and thank you, Doctor, for joining us and sharing your knowledge. Looking forward to getting the book. Awesome. Very good. Well, I enjoyed it. I could talk golf all day. So I know we I all know. Could. So could I. So could. But for everyone, we will email you Dr. Wood's contact information, how you can reach out to him. Um, if you have any uh, post-secondary questions that you forgot to ask, we will put them in a chat. And we will also uh, have this. This is this webinar has been recorded, so it will live up on a page. will let us know. And also send you the links if you want to rewatch this again. Um, anything else, Dr. Wood? You've been absolutely, I'm absolutely grateful to have you had you on our first webinar for, you know, to our golf. Anything Beautiful. Else? I mean, well, just, just continue awesome. to practice and we'd love to hear people responding with what they noticed, what they saw different. One, one last little piece is one of the other yeah. things I think we shared. If you have a bad shot, one of the things that I do is I rub down my arm. Wipe it off. Oh, tell us a little bit more. It. Yeah, it's just it's just like let it go. Wipe it off, right? And the more you use that, your mind feels that as that calm down. Let it go. Wipe yeah. it off. It, it it just seems so counterintuitive, right? Just mm -hmm. letting go. Yep. You, we want to have control. Yep. Consciously, that is. But for sure. But we, you know, it's not a game of perfect. It's I mean, here's a great analogy, Doc, for me that worked for me, right? Mm -hmm. Subconsciously, our, 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 our mind does everything for us, right? It does our own breathing. We don't have to consciously think about breathing. No. All, all the cells that get rejuvenated in our body, we don't consciously have to Automatic. think. Automatic. Yep. We don't have to have control of that. It does it for us. It's yep. that trusting that subconscious that will give us that performance. Your subconscious mind is running on programs. Your conscious mind is what creates the thoughts. And your conscious mind can mess up with your subconscious mind. It does. Yeah. And so I'll finish. I think I, we shared this during the session. One of the things I talk about, just to make it sort of interesting and sort of funny, I'm going to talk about the 5% of your conscious mind. I'm going to call that snowflake because no two people have the same intellect, same conscious mind. So snowflake is the 5%. The 95% I'm going to refer to as goat because it operates like primitive mind goat, right? So goat and snowflake, right? Conscious and subconscious. So the 95% goat and the 5% conscious mind get into a car to drive to downtown Phoenix. They run into a traffic jam. So now snowflake says to goat because they're always communicating. 
Snowflake says to Goat, I can't believe it. We're going to be late. We should have left 15 minutes earlier. And you know what Goat's going to say? No. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> let's leave 15 minutes earlier because that would solve the problem. Right. right. Because Goat is in the present. And that must be possible, right, if you yeah. said it. So now for the next five holes, Goat is trying to make the putt that you missed on the third hole, right? because it's seeing it in real time. That will mess you up. So it's a funny way to think about it. So if you find yourself doing that, you just gotta tell Snowflake, okay, we got all the information we needed from you. Let's let Goat play now, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, Doctor, well, thank you again so much. Uh, absolutely grateful for having you. I'm so happy that we could share some of your wonderful insight with all of our audience. That's This is amazing again. We will leave um, the information on how anyone can get a hold of you if they so desire. And if anybody has to post questions, we'll send you an email to everyone. So again, once again, thank you so much. And we look forward to chatting with you very soon. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend playing golf. Yes, have a great weekend. I'll come blind. I'll come <laughs> blind. That's the motto for the weekend, guys. That is, that's the motto for the week. Yep. Yes. And I'd love to hear from anyone who participated in the webinar um, any re positive results that they had if they've applied what Dr. Wood has shared with us today. Yeah, I'd love to hear that. Yes, wonderful. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a beautiful weekend. Yep. Take care. Bye-bye.